we're continuing our health check of the oceans by investigating the effects of climate change. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is heating up planet Earth. Since the Industrial Revolution, the world has warmed by one degree Celsius. The UN has just published its most comprehensive ever report on the threat that climate change poses to our oceans. If we warm the Earth by just one degree more, the consequences will be devastating. I'm investigating the impact of this warming world from here in the North Sea. Sandwiched between Great Britain and Northwest Europe, its waters have warmed twice as much as the global ocean in the past 50 years. Whatever's happening here can give us clues as to how the rest of the planet's oceans might be affected. One of those impacts is that a warmer world could drive more extreme weather. The wind's going to pick up. It's just starting to rain now. So I think the North Sea has been kind to us for all of 12 hours and it is about to regain its normal character and I think the weather could be quite enthusiastic this evening. The North Sea is notorious for its storms. The season begins in autumn after the ocean has basked in a long summer of sunshine. The energy on Earth comes in from the sun and then it travels through the Earth system, through the ocean and the atmosphere, and eventually it gets radiated away into space. So there's a flow in and a flow out. And the problem of the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide is that they slow down the flow out. So more energy is coming in than is leaving. That's where global warming comes from. It's that additional energy that we're accumulating every year. And the next question is, where does it go? And the answer, and we can measure this, is that since 1970, 93% of that additional energy has ended up in our oceans. One of the predictions for a warming world is that hurricanes, because the ocean is warmer, they'll have more fuel and so they'll be more intense. A large hurricane can expend as much energy as 10,000 nuclear bombs. And a hotter world will likely increase their power. As night falls, the windstorm sweeps through. PhD student Tim de Groot is worried that his sampling is at risk. You just uh, you talk with the crew, like they are in, in charge of the safety. If they think it's unsafe enough, then we won't do it. Uh, in my opinion, we can always do it. Up on the bridge, the captain is monitoring the wind. Encountering a storm now, but on the Beaufort scale, minimum force eight, getting to nine, and sometimes speaking to a ten. When you reach 12, it's going to be a hurricane. We have slightly less, but it's rough storm. 100 kilometer per hour gusts create a heavy swell. So the crew is struggling to bring the CTD in safely. And my kit is at risk too. I have this nightmare about my science kits sliding all over the floor, you know, as the ship rocks, things falling off and getting broken and hitting things. It's too much for us to do the job safely. So we cancelled all the operations for the night. The storm has deprived the team of an important set of data. I'm hoping the waves haven't put an end to my science plans as well. So I'm coming into the lab space here. And the waves haven't got to it. Everything is still there and still secure. So I feel a lot better now.
As the world warms and sea levels rise, more powerful storms will batter the British coast, bringing more floods with them. Scientists predict that by the year 2050, once a century floods could happen as often as once a year. Six days into the voyage, we've arrived at a spot that reveals just how dramatically the North Sea's coastline has changed in the past. It's a spot made familiar by the shipping forecast. Dogger, southwest four or five, becoming cyclonic, then west later, seven to severe gale nine, perhaps storm 10 later. Dogger Bank is 240 kilometers east of Whitby and the biggest sandbank in the North Sea. I'm up on the ship's bridge with Chief Officer Len Bleemer to take a closer look. So that's our position at the moment. You can see we're right on the edge of the Dogger Bank. You can see the depths in meters. The Dogger Bank is like 15 to 25 meters. That's really shallow. It's really shallow, yeah. The thing I love about this map is that you look out here and it's quite a flat day today, but you, what we can see all around, we can see sea and there's an oil platform. And other than that, it all looks exactly the same. And as yeah. soon as you look at a chart, it becomes a place. Does it all look the same to you or do you, are you aware of like you're passing through areas? We are aware because we, when we start our shifts on the bridge, we always know what to expect. And if it's not there, then it means <laughs> got to worry. we go the wrong way. Just 9,000 years ago, our ship couldn't even have sailed above the Dogger Bank. Because this whole area and everything around it would have been land. And this is a reconstruction of the area at that time. And you can see Britain on the left here and then Norway and Europe on the right. And in between, instead of the English Channel and the North Sea, we can see there's this great big plain here. And this was Doggerland. And the thing I love about this map is that you can see that there were hills, you can see the rivers and this big lake in the middle. Humans lived here. We've got archaeological artefacts. Um, fishermen have been dredging up things like stone axes from this area and there are bones of animals that lived here. We've got the evidence that this was a real place. But it's not here anymore. And to see what happened to it, we just have to wind the maps forward in time a little bit. So this is now 10,000 years ago, and you can see the big plain of Doggerland is still here. Still looks like a place you could visit. But over here, this is 9,000 years ago, and now this is the end of the last ice age, and sea level is starting to rise. And as it rises, it covers over the lowest parts of Doggerland, and it keeps rising and keeps rising, so that there's only this little bit left 8,200 years ago. And then by 7,000 years, Doggerland has gone. It's vanished underneath the sea. The lost marshes of Doggerland show just how dramatically sea levels have changed over the North Sea's history. In just a few thousand years at the end of the last ice age, melting ice sheets and warmer oceans made sea levels rise by more than 30 metres. Today, sea levels are rising faster than at any time since then. And this time, it's caused by us. Three degrees of warming by the year 2100 could see major world cities like Miami, Shanghai and Osaka engulfed by the sea. At Wallasey Island, near the mouth of the Thames, just 50 miles from London, an ambitious project is working with nature to develop a pioneering form of flood defence. I'm joining Jeff Q, who oversaw the development of the site. Hi, Jeff. George, hello. Welcome to Wallasey nice, Island. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Now, how, how big an area is this? Well, Wallasey Island, it's the largest coastal habitat restoration site in Europe. So we're standing on a seawall that was built in about 1500. To this side, we have the River Roach, which is tidal. Uh, and on the other side, we have Wallasey Island. And that farmland, or used to be farmed, is a lot lower. Yeah, it's lower than sea, sea level, so we're about a metre and a half below high tide level. So we're now coming down off the seawall onto the seaside of the wall. 
Now, this is a very simple structure. It's just a, an earth bank with a concrete block face. Yeah, simple seawall, but designed on the assumption that there would always be salt marsh in front. And what's the problem? Well, I can see bits of the problem here. Yeah, you it's can breaking see the, up. You can see the problem very clearly here. What's happened is the, the salt marsh in front has been lost through erosion, allowing the sea to attack these blocks and erode the wall. The problem is, with rising sea levels, this will happen extensively over whole lengths of walls and then the whole thing becomes unsustainable. Jeff's ingenious solution to the crumbling seawalls is to make use of the miraculous properties of the salt marsh itself. Jeff's team breached seawalls to the north and east of Wallasey Island and transformed 280 hectares of arable fields into salt marsh and mudflats. He's agreed to show me an overview of the work so far. For us, seeing these images, I mean, it's, um, it's fantastic because we were achieving exactly what we set out to do. If we fly down here gently, we're heading to the northern breach. So this is the breach which takes the majority of water in and out of the site each tide. Now, every time the tide comes in, it will drop silt. All this shiny mud that you can see, that's all new mud that's come in. So this site has already accreted since breaching. This silt, carried in by the tide, is transforming Wallasey. Crucial to the whole habitat is the salt marsh vegetation. Well, Jeff, this at first glance, it doesn't look very interesting, but actually up close, there's lots and lots of plants here. Yeah, there's a great diversity of salt marsh plants already growing. What makes them so useful to us? They provide quite a dense mat of stems, and what these do is when the sea comes in, laden with silt, the silt drops, it's trapped by the vegetation, and then the ground just goes up and up as this silt is caught. And this enables the salt marsh to physically go up in height progressively. Uh, and what we think with rising sea levels is that many of these marshes will be able to just keep going up and keep up with levels of sea level rise. So it's, it's a win-win. If we don't try and fight the natural world, it will help us in the end. We, we need to provide space for nature uh, and habitats like this and use nature to help us. Thanks to the rewilding of Wallasey Island, the reserve has become a major new home for breeding birds. Almost 150 pairs of avocets live here year-round, more than at any other site in the UK. The growing salt marsh is also the best possible habitat to combat rising greenhouse emissions. As it traps silt, it locks away 50 times more atmospheric carbon than a forest of the same size. Well, it's hard to believe that what I'm looking at it was arable fields only four years ago. And it just goes to show we don't have to defend ourselves against sea level rise by using enormous amounts of concrete. Natural flood defences like this could help fight the sea level rise we will face in the coming century, saving many coastal communities in Britain and around the world. The extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere won't just affect the planet through climate change and sea level rise. It has a dramatic effect within the ocean too. My own area of research investigates what's going on. It's the study of ocean bubbles. We've got these breaking waves on the surface and they're doing something really interesting. They're helping the ocean breathe. So when a wave breaks, it takes little pockets of the atmosphere down underneath the surface of the ocean. And it's the big bubbles in these breaking waves, the ones that we can see are helping push carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the ocean. 
the ocean is actually taking up something like 25 to 30 percent of all the extra carbon dioxide that, that's going up into the atmosphere. This natural carbon capture sounds like good news, but it comes at a price. A price that threatens the ocean ecosystems more immediately than a changing climate. Ocean acidification. I've got a tank of seawater here, and what I've got down here is dry ice. So this is solid carbon dioxide that's frozen. So I'm going to add it to the seawater. Ooh! <laughs> that is a lot of bubbling. Loads of bubbles. The solid carbon dioxide is turning into a gas, and as it bubbles through the water here, making all this lovely vapour. Some of it will be coming out of the water, but lots of it will be dissolving in the water in the tank here. So this is a pH meter that measures how acid or alkaline the water is. And as the carbon dioxide dissolves, we can see the effect on the pH. The ocean's pH should be 8.1, but our seawater reading is rapidly dropping. This number going down means that the water here is becoming more and more acidic as more and more carbon dioxide dissolves into it. Now this is just a small tank, but humanity is currently conducting an experiment that is very similar to this on a global scale. The oceans are massive, but the amount of carbon dioxide we're adding to them is also gigantic. And even though our oceans are big, we can already measure this. We know that humanity has already changed the pH of the entire global ocean. The carbon dioxide we've emitted into the atmosphere has increased the ocean's acidity by just a small fraction of a single pH unit. That doesn't sound like much, but it's enough to radically alter one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth coral reefs. Coral covers less than 1% of the ocean floor, but it supports over 25% of the species in the sea. The hard parts of corals and the shells of shellfish are built from a material called calcium carbonate, one that's particularly sensitive to acid conditions. How will these creatures cope with a more acidic ocean? To find out, I've got to wear some protective clothing. That was quite a dramatic reaction. Now what I just put into the tank with these shells was a really strong acid, hydrochloric acid. What's happening here is the acid is actually dissolving away the shells. The ocean is naturally alkaline and creatures like this can build their shells quite easily in an alkaline environment. But once you add an acid, what you do is you take away the most important building block they have, calcium carbonate. It becomes harder for them to harvest it from their surroundings and build into their shells. I left my shells in their acid bath for four hours and then they've been sitting in fresh water for a day. And just look at what's happened to them. That beautiful conch shell has almost been entirely eaten away. And this is extreme, but it does highlight the point that for creatures that build their home from calcium carbonate, it really matters how acid or alkaline their environment is. And actually even a small shift could make a really big difference. This is an extreme example. But our experiment demonstrates the vulnerability of shells to a more acidic ocean. Some waters off North America's west coast are so acidic that they can dissolve the shells of sea snails called pteropods. In 2016 and 2017, ocean acidification contributed to the major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. Bleaching is when coral ejects the colourful algae that keep the coral alive. And scientists fear that all coral reefs could be lost by the end of the century. 
it's already too late to reverse the ocean acidification we've caused so far. If our carbon emissions continue unchecked, then the pace at which our entire planet warms also threatens to escape our control. Carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas. Next on the list is methane, and methane is currently contributing about a fifth to global warming. In the final leg of our North Sea health check, we're 200 miles northwest of the Dutch coast. The Pelagia's chief scientist Helga and his team are conducting an important experiment. They're searching for a methane seep at the bottom of the North Sea. Methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, about 30 times more powerful than CO2. Methane has a more complex molecular structure than carbon dioxide, and it traps more heat from the sun. If a large amount of seafloor methane escapes to the atmosphere, then the warming effect could be dramatic. In the 1980s, scientists discovered a form of methane ice called methane hydrate that forms naturally at the bottom of the ocean. These images show its crystal structure. Scientists estimate that more than 1,000 trillion cubic metres of methane ice is frozen away in ocean sediments. That's more carbon than in all the world's oil and gas reserves combined. So there's this picture where in the Arctic, sort of locked away in cold places, yeah. there is this huge store of methane and it's just sitting there. Yeah. If the ocean warms up, then indeed more methane is coming and then we have uh, a positive feedback loop. So the warmer it gets, the more methane comes, thus the warmer it gets. Helga's trying to discover how much methane the gas seeps can deliver to the atmosphere. So the team used the ship's sonar to search for a spot where they believe bubbles are leaking from a peat bog buried beneath flooded Doggerland. On the map here, we've got the place where you last <coughs> saw it. Exactly. And we're just coming up to it. Yeah. And, uh, oh, okay, now we have oh, yes. yeah, yeah, you yes. can already it's see coming. it. Nice. Okay, you can see it here on the left as well, a bit more... Uh... Oh, yeah, that's it's a very strong reflection, so, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It's very nice. Now we've found the seep, I can deploy my own bubble camera. I'm hoping I can help Helga's research by measuring how big the bubbles are. And measuring bubbles is what I do in my professional life. This is quite a special camera. There are flashes that only last for 20 millionths of a second. It lights up a very precise part of the ocean and it can see all the bubbles just at that moment. We have uh, seen on the multi-beam that uh, flare is basically just under us, so we have a relatively high chance that the bubbles will come to the surface. If we're in the correct spot, my camera will give me 15 chances every second to image the methane bubbles, allowing me to measure their size. It's back on board, so it's all right. We're happy. <laughs> now we've just got to see what data's on it. My pictures reveal the individual methane bubbles climbing through the water column. Bigger bubbles float all the way to the sea's surface and deliver their methane to the atmosphere. But there are other bubbles that dissolve into the sea before they can make it to the top. Can anything in the seawater prevent this dissolved methane from reaching the atmosphere and accelerating global heating? To find out, Helga lowers a pump into the water and pushes 150 litres of seawater through filter paper. We want to study this specifically looking at microbes which are hovering in the water column and while this methane is bubbling through, they're sitting there waiting, are hungry, feeding on this methane. You can light methane, so it, it burns, so there's chemical energy in it. And there are some organisms that can also make use of this chemical energy in a, in a very similar way as you for, and I are, for instance, making use of sugar. The team carefully remove layers of filter paper from inside the pump. 
Sitting on each piece are billions of methane-eating bacteria. So the big question is actually, how effective are these microbes? Do they really eat up all the methane? If not, how much is going into the atmosphere? The team launches the CTD rosette to take seawater samples at five meter intervals, starting 30 meters down at the origin of the leak. It then takes samples in the middle of the water column and finally at the surface. So we know how much methane is at the bottom layer, how much methane is at the top layer, and how much methane is in between of this. And with these concentration profiles, you can then model how much methane is making its way up into the atmosphere. So, what do Helga's results reveal? We know that they are quite effective because we know a lot of methane is being produced in ocean sediments, but only relatively little is making its way up into the atmosphere. Helga and his colleagues have found that ocean microbes consume more than 90% of the methane that has dissolved into the seawater. His team will spend the coming months analysing how that figure can change with varying ocean conditions. Most importantly, as the climate continues to warm, will these bacteria still do such a good job? We could have a very, very gradual change, and then these methane-eating microbes, I think, have a very good chance of uh, multiplying and then basically taking care of the problem. So they can keep up. As yeah, long exactly. as it only comes out slowly, they can keep up. Exactly. But um, there's also quite some concern that things may go rapidly, at least in certain areas, specifically in, in regions like the uh, East Siberian Shelf. All of a sudden, the, the increase is becoming quite tremendous. And then you may also have the situation where the methane-eating microbes cannot keep up. So if we warm everything too quickly and the gas, the methane gas escapes too quickly, the bacteria don't stand a chance and it will reach the atmosphere. Yeah. Exactly. Helga's research is an important new contribution to climate science, and it matters because a sudden runaway release of methane could lead to a much hotter world. This possibility is just one of the reasons that the United Nations wants to limit future warming to half a degree Celsius. Now, there's evidence that our global impact is so heavy that we're depriving our sea of the very thing life needs to survive, oxygen. This is a lovely little globe, which is a self-sustaining ecosystem. So that means everything in here is recycled. And there's only a few things in there. There's these tiny little shrimp, there's algae, and there's bacteria. And everything that those little shrimp and the algae and bacteria need for life is just cycling round and round. And one of the most important things in here is oxygen. And so there will be some oxygen in the air up here, some in the water. When they photosynthesize, the plants will give it out. And then the shrimp will breathe it back in when they respire. And then it'll go round and round. And so in theory, these little shrimp have everything they need for life all locked up in that. All they need is some sunlight. Just like the life in this globe, life on Earth forms one interconnected ecosystem. One of the crucial features in this global ecology is the level of oxygen in the ocean. If you think about nature harvesting the sun's energy, we normally think about trees and meadows, but that's only half the story because fully half of Earth's sun harvest comes through these, and these are the phytoplankton. They're tiny, too small to see individually, but they're doing exactly the same job. And it's an amazing contrast. If you think about a tree, it's a huge organism. It lives for tens or hundreds of years. It's fixed in one place. And yet these are the rainforest of the ocean. Together, these tiny life forms supply more than 50% of planet Earth's oxygen. That's more than double the oxygen produced by all the world's rainforests combined the plankton forms blooms that are so large we can even see them from space. What's going on here is that there is a bloom, a phytoplankton bloom, which means that loads of 
tiny single cell plant-like organisms have suddenly got the right conditions to grow all at the same time. And the reason for that is that cold, nutrient-rich water has come up to meet the sunlight and everything is there for life to explode. These satellite photographs show plankton blooms in the Yellow Sea off South Korea, in the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska, and in the Black Sea off Turkey's northern shore. Remarkably, these plankton blooms stretch across the world's oceans and pulse in and out with the seasons. So here we are in summer now in the northern hemisphere, there's almost no ice, and then it goes into winter and there's a little extra little puff of life. And then when the spring comes, suddenly the ocean lights up. And so every year there's a cycle like this. This is the Earth breathing. But these cycles are knocked out of kilter when the nutrients contained in fertilizers run off from farms and feed super blooms of plankton in the ocean. When these plankton die, they sink and rot consuming the sea's vital oxygen. In 2019, an 8,000 square mile stretch of sea at the mouth of the River Mississippi was classified as a dead zone. And scientists fear that a combination of excess nutrients and warmer waters could see oxygen levels drop so much in many parts of the ocean that creatures like sharks and turtles will suffocate, whilst jellyfish will thrive. If we can breed new strains of crops and develop more sustainable farming methods, there's hope that we'll be able to spray less fertiliser onto our fields and revitalise the dead zones killing our seas. After two weeks on board the Pelagia, our ocean autopsy is complete. I've seen firsthand the impact our actions are having in the waters off our own shores. But right now, I can't wait to get my feet back onto dry land. I've returned to Holland to find out what Helen's learned from her time at sea. Well, I just got off the ferry from the mainland over to Texel and I'm just heading to meet Helen. To, I'm really keen to find out how she's got on. After, say, two weeks on a boat in the North Sea, it's not something I'd be queuing up to do. <laughs> and there she is, the Pelagia. Helen. Hello. How are you doing? How have you been? How was it? It was, you know, bumpy in places, but mostly... Bumpy in places. Yeah, yeah I'm not a natural sailor, I have to say. <laughs> well, that's when it gets fun, right? It's when once, once the bumps start coming along, that's when you're really living at sea. Well, let's have a debrief. The last two weeks, you've seen it firsthand, just what sort of impact we're having out there. So I've not been out in the North Sea before, I've mostly been out in the open ocean. And the biggest thing I noticed, it's not just that it's changing because that's a natural thing, it's that it's changing faster than the system can keep up. I'm just beginning to get a grip on how much stuff gets washed into the sea. It seems incredible to me that PCBs, which are an entirely man-made chemical uh, group, were, were banned 40, 50 years ago. But they're still having their effects as they m magnify through the food chain and when I dissected the porpoise I did get a very strong sense of this being a warning actually, to say to us guys can you stop doing this please I think that we're getting close to too many things changing at once because the problem is the things that are stressing the life it's not just one thing it's not just plastics or just you know pollution or just the temperature change they're getting knocked from all sides there must be a different way but i think everybody would agree that the oceans have been pushed too far this is why research ships like the Pelagia are so important because they let us go and find things out and the more we understand the more we can be really sure that we're making better decisions in the future. That's the thing that keeps me at least a little bit optimistic is that actually now we, we're starting to have enough knowledge to, to really understand. And we need to take those 
hard choice, make those hard choices now. So what choices do we need to make to protect our seas? Can we safeguard marine ecosystems by ending our throwaway culture? Can we ensure that any new toxic chemicals we invent will not persist through the ocean food chain? And can we prevent those we've already made from finding their way into the sea? Can we limit global carbon emissions to give the oceans a chance of recovering from their current state? These are massive challenges, and whether we can meet them is uncertain. But there are positive signs. And to see this for ourselves, we're taking one last trip off our own coast. We're on our way to a site where human infrastructure and wildlife successfully exist side by side. And the sea is very calm, which is good because we're going out into it. It's very good for Just me. Over a few miles that way, uh, you're not you're not a keen seafarer. <laughs> We're sailing out to the Scroby Sands Wind Farm, just a few kilometres off the Norfolk coast. Wind farms have helped the UK to reduce its carbon footprint by almost 40% since 1990. And they now produce one-fifth of Britain's electricity. The aim is to raise that to a third by 2030, but that will require the erection of 5,000 new turbines. We've seen that the noise produced by hammering turbines into the seabed is bad news for marine life. So the offshore wind industry is under pressure to do things in a better way. It's one of those things where knowledge is the thing you need. There are ways now to build wind turbines that, that make less noise. You can put shielding around the outside so the noise doesn't get out. If you get them right, you can perhaps put your wind farm in the best place for it. You can choose a place where it can have benefits on the, the local ecology. So the actual structure of the wind turbine provides a home for animals. People have called them an artificial reef. There's quite a lot of concrete and rocks and, and hard substrate, and that's where life is really getting a grip. There's small animals coming, there's lots of fish, lots of animals, they'll be eating the fish. You've got seals, because I saw at least three seals. You can actually see it so in the video here from a few years ago and the red line is a single seal that one is seal. going from one wind turbine to the next to feed. So it's yeah. basically working its way. The seal knows this is a good place to fish. Yeah, yeah. it's feeding, doing very well and it knows exactly which yeah, side yeah. of its bread is button. Globally, grey seals are endangered. But here in the UK, their numbers have grown hugely since seal hunting was banned in the 1980s. British and Irish waters are now home to half of all the grey seals on Earth. There's no doubt the wind turbines are changing the ecology, but if they're changing it to make it more biodiverse and to bring back wildlife, that, then that's a good that, thing. you can see that as a positive thing. So when I see an offshore wind farm now, I will actually think, well, that could be a little marine park. Our autopsy of the North Sea has shown that it's in crisis and that the world's oceans are headed in the same direction. But it's also revealed that the oceans themselves might hold the key to their own survival. We've seen just a few of the functions that ocean life can perform. Ocean plankton produces more than 50% of the oxygen we breathe. Fungi and bacteria could break down and digest plastic and methane. Salt marsh plants can fight sea level rise and trap carbon at the same time. Life in the ocean is so diverse that it could fight back against many of the challenges we're throwing at it. But it's at a tipping point. This is the crucial moment to change our behaviour. If we leave it any longer, it will be too late. The fact that that one is only 
under a week old, it means it's got lots to <laughs> drink well, of its mum well. and she must be reasonably healthy and fit. It shows that wildlife can be resilient if you give it a chance and you look after it. That's the one thing that actually offers a huge amount of hope for me, is that if you give the natural world a chance, it will come back. And if we stop doing all the things that we know we shouldn't be doing, this is going to happen all over the place.